Good evening, everyone, or uh, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. I'm David Silberklang. I'm a senior historian at uh, the International Institute for Holocaust Research at Yad Vashem, and I'll be uh, chairing the current panel discussion, which we hope uh, Helmut Walser smith uh, supposed to be part of it, will be able to get back online. Uh, so uh, we'll be talking now about the spatial turn and environmental history, new perspectives uh, on the Holocaust and on Holocaust research. Um, and uh, anyone who's been reading Guy Miron's uh, work the last few years has been following uh, certainly, and uh, some other people as well, of course, uh, his own work in these fields. So let, I'd like to introduce uh, first of all, the two speakers uh, in this panel. Uh, and uh, then when Helmut joins us, I don't have to introduce him uh, again. I'll start with Helmut uh, Walser smith He's uh, the Martha Rivers Ingram Professor of History at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. He's published widely and among his books, Germany, a Nation in Its Time, Before, During and After Nationalism, 1500 to 2000, a book he published last year, uh, The Continuities of German History, Nation, Religion, and Race Across the Long 19th Century, and his award-winning book, The Butcher's Tale, Murder and Antisemitism in a German Town, which won a variety of awards and was runner-up for other awards and was uh, selected by uh, Damals, uh, the German popular history magazine, as one of the three most innovative works of uh, nonfiction for 2003. And Professor Guy Miron, who is uh, Vice President for Academic Affairs at the Open University of Israel, where he teaches Jewish history. His research focuses on German and Central European Jewish history in the 20th century, Hungarian Jewish history and Jewish and Israeli historiography, and he's published uh, widely. I'll just mention two of his books, uh, one is German Jews in Israel, Memories and Past Images, published in Hebrew 16 years ago, 17 years ago. And the mm -hmm. other is uh, The Waning of Emancipation, Jewish History, Memory, and the Rise of Fascism in Germany, France, and Hungary, uh, which has been published in English and in Hebrew uh, nine years ago. And his forthcoming book that he's been publishing articles and generating a lot of material and speaking at conferences, fascinating stuff he's come up with that I've read and heard, uh, deals with time and space in the Jew German Jewish experience under the Nazi regime. And I would add, of course, we're having this session uh, on uh, International Holocaust Memorial Day. And I'll also point out, since we're talking about environment, that uh, we just began the Jewish holiday of Tu Bishvat, which of course connects to environment and trees, the uh, Jewish Arbor Day. Um, what we're going to do is give each speaker around 10 minutes to open up and uh, present some ideas in this uh, pretty new field of research and certainly as it connects to the Holocaust. And then we'll uh, open some dialogue between them and open also for any comments, questions that people might have, which you can write in the chat. So uh, Guy, I think we're yeah, going to okay. be with you. Thank you, and I really hope that my internet connection will uh, will be stable enough. Okay, so um, in my short presentation, uh, I want to present a few ideas about the possibility to uh, innovate in the uh, historiography of the Holocaust from the perspective of the spatial turn and environmental history. Uh, as David presented in the last couple of years, I dealt, I dealt in, in a, 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 an attempt to uh, reconstruct the German-Jewish uh, experience under the Nazi regime from uh, the uh, spatial perspective, but not necessarily the environmental perspective in the more specific sense that we discuss here uh, today. I want to share with you some of the sources that I located and some of my insights uh, about this field and its potential. And in the last uh, two or three minutes, I want also to relate to the ghettos in Eastern Europe from the environmental perspective, just you know, uh, to point on, on what can be discussed. Uh, Helmut uh, uh, prepared the talk about uh, uh, spaces in Eastern Europe from the Nazi perspective. I read some of the stuff to prepare for this, so I hope we will be able to, uh, 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 to discuss these two perspectives together. Um, when we discussed about the preparation of this session a few days ago, 
Uh, the topics, uh, the topic of the concepts between space and environment, and we discussed to include both. Um, one might say that space is a more neutral uh, concept, while while environment is more specifically uh, connected in our imagination to uh, nature and landscape, which are also part of space, of course. Uh, but this uh, uh, dichotomy, and uh, both of us, uh, Helmut and I, agreed about it when we spoke also with uh, uh, um, Dominic about it uh, when we prepared for this uh, uh, session. This dichotomy should not uh, uh, be a dichotomy between uh, rural and urban, because also in the urban experience, one can speak about environmental uh, uh, experiences, and even in the domestic experience that we all share now, there is an environmental uh, aspect and I want to relate to it in the context of my own research about Jews in Germany during the Nazi uh, period. When I dealt uh, in my work with uh, um, uh, diaries and Jewish uh, uh, journals uh, in, in Nazi Germany, I found that German Jews dealt a lot, quite a lot, uh, not only in the question of, of how they see German nature and German landscape, uh, rural and urban alike, uh, both in the uh, public discourse and in the more intimate uh, and, and personal private uh, correspondences. And this, of course, has to do with the concept of Heimat, the way they see the connection to the German Heimat. Since the late 19th century, German Jews had to cope with the uh, folkish anti-Semitic uh, uh, ideas that presented Jews as an alien and foreign to the German nation and try to exclude the Jews, both symbol symbolically, but also, also sometimes also practically from the German landscape and nature. The Nazi period, of course, brought this to a peak and it is part of the shaping and creating or inventing the uh, uh, Volksgemeinschaft, the German Volksgemeinschaft, the German Landschaft, the German landscape as, as, decide, as described by one of the scholars became a major element of the German Nazi Lebensraum. And this, was a, a, a part of the background of the uh, inclusion, uh, exclusion of the Jews. Now, from my perspective, I was uh, dealing with the Jewish experience and more specifically with the way uh, Jewish writers uh, uh, try to preserve and uh, recreate their sense of agency in these circumstances, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the special exclusion. In summer 1933, uh, the Jewish press discussed the problem of accessibility of uh, Jewish youth uh, who were uh, young uh, uh, Jewish adults who were uh, excluded from the uh, Reich uh, uh, youth associations uh, and they were uh, uh, not be able anymore to, to uh, be hosted in uh, German youth hostels. And that's why they could have been alienated to German nature. In an editorial published in the Zentral Freie Zeitung in June 1933, the great importance of traveling throughout Germany in order to uh, get in groups to Verwurzelung of the Jews in the German landscape was dis uh, described. And there was a fear that excluding the Jewish youth from the German Landschaft will, will uh, make them uh, uh, asphalt Leute, uh, people of the city in the bad sense of the, of the word. A variety of other articles called Jewish establishment and Jewish youth to take responsibility on creating a new accessibility to German nature. For example, to uh, make a systematic arrangement with Jewish rural communities instead of the German uh, youth hostels and order make the also make the connection between uh, German landscape and Jewish history in, in, in rural Germany. Um, the activity of the Akshara, uh, uh, agriculture training uh, um, uh, uh, camps that I cannot re relate here in, in details, did not deal, I think, only with preparation to immigration from Germany. It also reflected in some cases, and there were also non-Zionist agricultural uh, uh, camps uh, trying to get rooted in the German soil and nature, at least in the first years of the, of the Nazi regime. The intimic uh, connection to the German landscape and, and nature did not concern only youth. It was discussed also in diaries and articles of uh, adult uh, 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 Jewish men, uh, men and women. Thus, for example, now uh, I will share my uh, uh, screen with a few uh, sources. Um, thus, for example, a Jewish lawyer uh, from Hamburg, uh, Kurt Rosenberg, 
uh, described in his diary in May, May 1st, 1934, how he went with his family from the city to the nature uh, to, move from the, uh, to move away from the uh, uh, tumult or, and the Nazi propaganda of the Nazi National Festival of Work. As you know, the May 1st became one of the uh, Nazi holidays actually taken from the socialist tradition to the uh, 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 Nazi legacy. And this is the quotation, we are avoiding the masses and wandering in the quiet forest under the bright sky, reflecting about the human, which is called the real human, not the, not, not the uh, false human that they see in the city, the human which is close to the nature and not subjected to politics. So this is one way to see the German landscape. And this is connected if you read Rosenberg also to the specific attachment to, to Germany. But this view of German nature as a pure and immune uh, space from the process of Nazification and the place where pure humanity is situated that you can find also in other uh, diaries began to diminish uh, as the situation of German Jews deteriorated. And we can see it in Rosenberg's diary a little more than a year later in July, 1935, after coming back from the short uh, uh, vacation in Switzerland, he relates to the German a, a landscape uh, that he experienced with coming back to Germany, with meeting again the Nazi uh, uh, um, uh, atmosphere. This land, which I've come, to, which I came to know intimately with its landscape, deeply rooted in the city and the country. Now he asks, will it all become now foreign after more than two years of preaching about the racial gospel? Did this landscape become alienated to me? From this point until his uh, immigration from Germany in 1937, Rosenberg experienced the uh, uh, connection to the German nature in a more and more disrupted way, as though living on a bold time until his uh, immigration. And this is only one example you can find also in the Jewish press uh, discussing about how the connection to the German nature is actually being poisoned uh, uh, for the Jews. Looking for nature as a place of comfort became more common among some of the writers that stayed in Germany and could not immigrate as the uh, 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 experience of exclusion escalated from the German uh, uh, um, public sphere, especially after the pogrom of November 1938 and after the beginning of World War II. As the pressure from the outside became more intensive, the need to experience as much as they could the, their space uh, and, and to expand the limits of the border of the space became more, more intensive. Willy Kohn from Breslau and Viktor Klemper from Dresden, perhaps the two most famous German Jewish diarists uh, during, during this period, describe evening and night stalls in the urban environment and also in the woods and the nature around their cities, especially in the first year of Second World War. Both had to come to terms in a daily, on a daily basis with the, Nazi, with the night curfews that forced the Jews to be closed at home from nine, sometimes even 8 p.m., but still tried to take as much as they could from their hours of, of freedom. Going to uh, work in, uh, uh, in, her, in, in the uh, uh, factory as part of the uh, uh, um, forced labor, uh, in uh, early 1942 and beginning of 1943, in the last year, we, in the last months before she was expelled to Auschwitz, was described in the letters of the German Jewish poet Gertrud Kolmar as a kind of a naturzatz, as a substitute for nature, and also for a source of pleasure. Kolmar, as other Jews were still living in Germany at this time, most of them could not document it, but some did, described how sometimes they picked the longer way to the factory and back in order to experience more the nature and environment. As in other public spaces, also at home, uh, in the private sphere, Jews tried to get the, the most from their, out of their ever-diminishing domestic space. In 1941, the teacher and the musician Arno Nadel and his wife had to leave their house in Berlin and rent a room in the, in the apartment of another Jewish couple. The diary of Nadel includes, specifically in 1942, more than before, very rich emotional entries discussing with nature and, and German landscape, memories from the age in which he made a lot of hikes in the lakes around Berlin. Now the nature lives in his memory. These landscapes were not 
accessible to Nadal anymore, but he found a small substitute in the balcony of his home where he was uh, uh, living. This is the next citation. No freedom, no nature. The little piece of balcony has to substitute for evening uh, uh, for everything. The balcony frequently reappears in his diaries as a place of small pleasures, relaxation, drinking coffee, watching the sky, which is another part of the nature that he can still uh, get hold of, enjoying the little bit of green that was accessible from its limited space. Similar description about the centrality of the balcony appeared in the diary of Philip Mannes, formerly a Berlin businessman, in July 1942, when Mannes was struggling with his hardships of forced labor and faced deportation. The balcony appears in his diary as the last refuge, and this is the last citation. Today, on July 4, this was finally hot enough and we could rest on the balcony. The view of the green leaves outside compensates for all the hours I have to stand and work uh, the machine. The entire week I look forward for Saturday that brings freedom after six and a half hours of work. This is the, uh, 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 what, he, what he writes uh, uh, then. Uh, for many Jews like Rosenberg, Korn, Klemperer, Kolmar, Nadel and Manes, nature and landscape was a resource, a crucial resource for their mental well-being. Acting out, trying, attempting to experience nature and even the last remnants of nature, even from their balcony, even in the last weeks and months before uh, deportation, were part of the struggle to preserve their human agency and their individuality. Now, in, 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 my last, in the last minutes of this talk, I will re relate very briefly to the environmental aspect of the ghettos in, in Eastern Europe. This is mostly based on my work as an editor of the Encyclopedia, <coughs> sorry, of the Adosham Encyclopedia of the History of the Ghettos. The most well-known type of ghetto, which is included in the, uh, uh, which is included in the largest ones, such as Warsaw, Lodz, and Krakow, it was established in a particular residential section of the city and was then fenced or surrounded in a wall or barbed wire fence. These were clearly urban ghettos. Some of the smaller ghettos, however, were located next to a natural barrier, a river, for example, Kamenitz Podolsk in Ukraine, or a lake. In other ghettos, sometimes in, mostly in smaller places, but sometimes even in larger communities like Berdice, for example, Jews were held in an open space ghetto situated in a poor part of the city, but was never fenced. The Warsaw ghetto can be considered as the most ultimate urban ghetto in uh, Eastern Europe. When its borders were uh, 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 constructed, and this, uh, about this I consulted with my uh, uh, colleague uh, Javi Dreyfus, she's an expert in the Warsaw ghetto. So when the borders of the Warsaw ghetto were constructed, all the gardens around the uh, 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 ghetto were uh, explicitly and deliberately taken out of it in a systematic way. Diaries in the ghetto describe uh, the lack of the uh, 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 experience of nature in the ghetto. Almost no tree, uh, were, were, trees were left and sometimes looking up to the sky was the only connection left for them to nature. In an article about the converts in the Warsaw Ghetto, Javi Dreyfus described the garden in the church in the ghetto, that the church that was serving the Jewish converts with actually Christians, as the only natural, uh, natural uh, uh, corner in the Warsaw Ghetto, as described by one of the diarists, the hidden corner in the midst of hell. Five Jewish children from the orphanage of Janusz Korczak asked, she writes, uh, from the church, a permission to get into the garden in Saturday mornings and explained that we long for a little air and greenery. Alienation from the nature was a little less, less radical in, in the other ghettos. Marishin, uh, a, a, sub, a, a more rural suburbs, uh, which was uh, next to the Lodge ghetto in, uh, in spring of 1940, was uh, a site for agricultural training and education. The agriculture uh, project in this ghetto, like others, also was partly also helping to come to terms with the uh, problem of, of hunger. This was also the case in other ghettos like, like Kovna. So trying to sum up, I might say that the environmental history in the future 
uh, of uh, might relate in the context of Eastern European uh, Jews during the Holocaust, also in a more systematic way to the nature in and around the ghettos, which happened until today only in passing. This is why it's clear that ghettos, for example, it's clear that ghettos in more uh, uh, rural uh, areas or closer to uh, uh, woods, uh, the possibility and the, the option of anti-Nazi uprising and, and uh, were much more intensive that, than, than others. But again, uh, combining these insights to a more uh, a clear uh, environmental perspective is something which we could be done in, in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Guy. That's uh, quite uh, interesting uh, material you've got there and insights. Uh, Helmut, uh, I understand from Irena, has, uh, does have some uh, internet problems and he's trying to reconnect. I don't think he's joined us yet, but he'll, hopefully we'll be here in a few minutes. So um, I, I wanted to, well, I want to open to any, anyone who has a comment or question, but I already have uh, two question, comment kind of things, but uh, then open it to everybody. Uh, one is, as you're talking about um, the uh, connection to nature and, and uh, you know, the, in 1933, 34, the need to, or the desire to go out into the woods, get fresh air, get away from the noise, I was reminded of 19th century romantic back to nature movements that, uh, you know, mm -hmm. the uh, is the Zionist movement also was impacted by that. It wasn't all you know, right-wing romantic nationalism, but it was romantic. Um, and the sense that, uh, that that went along with the sense that the, um, you know, er, there's something bad about uh, all this uh, concentration in urban centers. We need to get back to nature and all that. So do you, do you, do you see a connection like that? I mean, I, I'm saying that as a kind of, you associative connection, but do you, do you actually see that there's a yeah. connection with that and also what the Nazis were doing with the environment vis-a-vis -vis Jews and vis-a-vis -vis their own movement? The second thing I wanted yeah. to raise, and I see that there's an, another comment already that uh, we'll bring up, and that connects to um, the ghettos. Of course, you were the editor of the uh, Ghetto Encyclopedia, but more than half of the communities and uh, Jewish communities in Poland did not have a ghetto, and you didn't have to address that. But uh, one thing we know from survivor accounts from uh, some of these places is indeed that the, the fact that they could be connected to nature, they weren't talking about, oh, the breath of fresh air, but I, you know, I could go out and I continued uh, working on a farm and that gave me some income. Or I could go out and go to the local, uh, you know, the nearby uh, farmer and trade with him and get some food or whatever it was, but their connection to nature and environment because they didn't have a ghetto and because they were in a rural area um, impacted on them as well. Not only in the sense you, you were talking about, about you know, where there were forests they could go out and you know, have a place to flee to perhaps, but just in day to day before the liquidation of wherever they lived, it, uh, it gave them access to things. And also apparently the absence of a ghetto in those places uh, also help those uh, Jewish people in their, um, I don't know what to say, emotionally or in their ability to look around and make decisions because they didn't live in that mm -hmm. pressure cooker and intense uh, you know, uh, physical pressure uh, and, and disease ridden ghetto. Anyway, if you have any thoughts. Yeah, so I mean, for the first question, I think uh, basically sometimes yes. I mean, if you read uh, Kurt Rosenberg diaries and some of the other diaries, uh, they are heavily loaded with uh, uh, German cultural uh, uh, context. And uh, I didn't do it systematically. I mean, I think I said it also yesterday that I think part of the challenge in, in creating and in, in environmental history in, in this context of Jewish history. And, and, and my position comes from what I did, which is a little different than most of the talks here, which are you know more dealing with the experts and intellectuals and specific projects. And I go to the social history and, and going, back, going back to read the same sources we already read, but asking this question, Will, will give you new insight. So I didn't, I mean, I, I read again Klemper and, and Kohn to get the time and space context. But if you want to get the environment, it's another challenge, but I'm sure that they will be. And this is kind of a, 
of a cultural environmental history, which has to do also with the way uh, nature is, is uh, invented, imagined, and, and, and used again. And this has to do also with the way Jews in Germany, also in Poland maybe, see the local nationalism because the project of Jewish emancipation in, in Germany and also in other countries, I mean, you mentioned Hungary before, was, was a project of becoming a part of the, of the land and also part of the environment. And when the political system and the social system excluded the Jew, the question was actually about nature. Is this also part of the exclusion or maybe this is our way to still be attached? Uh, and, and, and you can find the tension, like I saw in Rosenberg, you find a tension between these two. And if you try to connect it to uh, the, the tradition of romanticism and the way Jews are describing uh, a diarist and, and, and journalist describing their uh, 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 the daily experiences loaded by, by German and or other this or, or other context of culture, this could be very interesting. Now to the second question, let, let me do something which you know you should you should not do, but I still uh, do it. I don't compare the Corona crisis with the Holocaust, but I, I I will say the following. I mean I think many of the Holocaust scholars and I had some talks with the friends in the first day in the first crisis of the, of the Corona, we thought about some aspects of maybe of our helplessness in the situation and maybe of the uh, fear from the unknown and also f f my perspective of time and space. So, I mean, think about living in New York City before the corona vis-a-vis -vis living in the country and then think about living in New York City during the height, the peak of the corona crisis, then living in the city is becoming the most terrible. I mean, you are, you are locked in a very small place and you don't have the, the option to, to, uh, uh, to, to see the, uh, the world. Where, where if you live in a, in, a, in a faraway suburb, which used to be much less prestigious before the crisis, now this is becoming a much better place. I think this is the same in, in this context, what you, you asked before, David, that living not in the ghetto, not in the major cities, but in more in marginal places, not only practically gave a, a better chance of, 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 of escaping or, or, or surviving, but also a, 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 a better mental well-being in a way, you, you, you might call it. And I think if you look at the diaries, I mean, one of the diaries I didn't mention here, Elizabeth Block, she's a, a, a teenager from, from Bavaria, and she's writing a lot about her daily life. You, you cannot see really the political uh, uh, aspects, but she's writing a lot about, about about nature, and you can see how this is a major part of her well-being. Hmm. Um, there's a comment here from uh, Philip Nielsen connected to what you were saying uh, hmm. that um, a, a scholar named Justina Majewska uh, from the Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw is working on green spaces in the Warsaw Ghetto. Hmm. You, maybe you know about it, uh, and especially uh, the efforts of Toporol in, uh, in that regard. Um, I would add to that an interesting observation I was also writing down to myself following on that. Um, and that is, uh, you know, the Jan Karski story. Now, Jan Karski, when he went into the Warsaw Ghetto, uh, it, it seems to me that it was in the middle or latter part of September 1942. So near the end of the Great Deportation or just after it. Um, and he was escorted in by the a uh, Bundes leader, Leon Feiner. And he spent two days there. He went in, came, went out, and then came back the next day. And at some point he walked around and he came to a tiny little green space in the ghetto. And he saw a few children playing there. And he asked a question. He asked Leon Feiner a question about what are they playing? And Feiner's answer was, they're not playing. They're only pretending to play. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, also is part of the impact of that environment on, uh, on them. Okay, but I see that now Helmut has succeeded in uh, rejoining oh, us. Oh, great. That's great. So Helmut, I've already introduced you. Everyone knows all about you. Helmut, okay. the floor is yours for your uh, presentation. Okay, first I'd like to say, can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah. But first I'd like to say I'm profoundly sorry about this. Um, I had set it all up so precisely this wouldn't happen. I was all ready to go and I just didn't understand why I couldn't get any access and finally it dawned on me that 
the Wi-Fi was irreparably down. That's also the first time since we've gotten the service that it's happened. So I'm really, again, I'm profoundly uh, sorry and, and thank you for your patience. So uh, I have about maybe a, a 10 minute uh, presentation. Does that sound right to you? Sounds just right. Okay. Okay, um, I would like to offer some thoughts. I hope these thoughts are not too elementary and self-evident. There has been considerable focus on what we following Tim Snyder have come to call the bloodlands. Those lands between European empires of the 19th century that have been the site or the space of so much bloodshed in the 20th century. I'm going to suggest that one might come at this from a different, level, a different angle than Snyder did. And the angle has to do with economics and in particular development economics and huge gaps in the uh, economic levels of spaces. Now I had some uh, graphs to show you, but they're not with me, they're on my other computer, but I think that it should be self-explanatory without them. The industrial, Rev what I'm talking about in particular is the industrial revolution and the great and the little divergence. The great divergence being the radical discrepancy in GDP per capita between the Northwest corner of Europe and parts of North America and much of Asia and Africa in the 19th century. This great divergence economically is the, under, is the reality that underpinned the rise and spread of empire in the 19th century and it undergird the military force of high imperialism circa 1900. The little divergence is the one that is in the same period of time, but separates Northern and Northwestern Europe from the South and from the East. It is not as severe, but as you would see on my graph, one notable aspect of it is that the difference between the leading and the trailing nations as Europe is actually larger in the first half of the 20th century than between those trailing nations in Eastern Europe and the poorest parts of the world. It is furthermore in the context of this little divergence or small divergence that Germany um, began to face East, looking to create an agricultural um, hinterland or a hinterland that produced primary products for its rapidly industrializing economy. And indeed, one may take Bismarck's famous phrase my map of Africa is in Europe, quite literally in this sense, in terms of economic growth and the creation of dependency zones. This was precisely what they thought of already in the late 19th century as the function for the German nation state of the East. And this is certainly what Adolf Hitler thought about when he began to think in terms of geopolitics. So here, the notion is that there is an economic scissors that happens in the 19th century. All development ec economists know about, it, know about its dynamics. And it in fact flows into the geopolitical thinking, especially of the far right in the early part of the 20th century. The second aspect of this um, that I want to talk about is the growth of integral nationalisms and its dreams of homogenous space. Um, that is to say, ethnic purity in a bounded contiguous realm, or to put it more directly, a Germany for the Germans, a Hungary for the Hungarians, and so on. This too draws on a kind of colonial experience. It is this, this notion of creating this uh, homogenous space is the conceptual framework uh, behind, for example, Indian removal in the United States and behind the general idea of reservations throughout the colonial world. In Europe, 
This idea of removal and reservations found its principal expression in the concept of ex expulsion as applied to cities, and, uh, territorial states, and Western European kingdoms, it is actually an old idea, as you all know, but it is now transposed in the early part of the 20th century onto modern nation states with dynamic economies and real and imagined population pressures. In the German case, there are two concepts that come together. One is this idea of settler empire, um, a primary products producing place that feeds essentially a dynamic industrial world empire on the one hand, and the expansion of this space and the idea of purity behind this space and the fact that Eastern Europe is not in fact full of Germans, it is full of other groups. Among those groups are, are the Jews. In fact, that is where, as you all know, the preponderance of Jews in Europe lived at the time. Let me take this background um, of thoughts about the late 19th century and the relationship of space and colonialism to the 20th century, to in fact, the outbreak of World War II. And I hope you'll see where some of these thoughts come together. It is of course well known, but sometimes insufficiently stressed that almost all Jews, in fact, virtually all Jews killed in the Holocaust are killed during the war. It is also well known, but also insufficiently stressed, that almost all of the killing occurred following the Nazi invasion, not of Poland, but of the Soviet Union. And it is widely known as well, but all perhaps under stressed, in its dimensions at least, that the invasion of the Soviet Union implied a gigantic increase in the military lethality of the war. One of the things that I would show on a graph, it really, it's, it's a gigantic uh, leap. It, it, it looks, when you, when you plot out military casualties, it looks essentially like the war began in the summer of 1941. Now, one could deduce from this that there is a relationship between the rise of lethality uh, in the war and the onset of unequivocal genocide. Yet there would be two very critical caveats, indeed objections, that one could make to this, that one should make to this. The first is that a gigantic number of Soviet soldiers who died in those first months of the war, some two million in fact, did so in POW camps, where they essentially froze to death and were starved to death, and that these camps were largely um, in the rear areas of, of the invading forces, and indeed stretched back, also mapped out, um, all the way back into the Old Reich, where, by the way, the lethality counts were just as high. Put differently, there was no military or logistical imperative to kill those soldiers driving up the sheer lethality of the war. The second caveat is the genocide as it commenced unequivocally in the summer and fall of 1941, did so not on the front, but in those rear areas of occupations. To put a sharp point on it is occupation policy, not simply war that creates the condition for both the enormous increase in lethality in 1941 and context for the beginning of the unequivocal genocide itself. This becomes especially clear when you take in uh, Nazi planning, and in particular planning concerning agriculture and food, and in, within that context, 
the very, very central uh, memorandum of Baca in the agricultural ministry that when the Nazi, when the Wehrmacht goes into the Soviet Union, it will have to be able to feed itself within a year. And that necessity will mean that they will take into account the deaths of tens of millions of Soviet citizens. The point I wanna make is that the relation between occupation, vast spaces and genocide is by no means quite as clear as one might think. One might, one, moreover, one will not see how it emerged if one focuses on the often professed bureaucratic efficiency of Nazi Germany. Indeed, there was not much that was modern in the sense of deriving the genocide from the spirit of science, to use Detlef Koikert's famous phrase, in the initial phases of the genocide in 19, 1941. Instead, what we see is that the initial killing evoked 19th century atrocities, the kind we would expect to see in the 19th century world of imperialism. Um, what I mean by this is encouraging pogroms, which did in fact uh, happen in the first weeks of the invasion uh, and were encouraged by the SS. What I mean by this is killing people with rapid fire guns, which is precisely the way that so-called administrative massacres happened in the colonial world, to use Hannah Arendt's phrase. One consequence of this approach to murder from the side of the Nazis is that it meant that given the vast spaces that they were covering, it meant that murder almost had to be practiced and indeed was practiced in the occupying areas um, by depending on local killing operators, Lithuanians, Ukrainians. What we see is actually in this attempt to create a large killing space, the Germans are forced into a great deal of cooperation uh, on the ground and a great deal of trying to get others to kill as well. We see this in, with jarring clarity in a very famous document uh, with regards to Lithuania, the so-called Jaeger Report of December 1941. In this infamous report, we see place after place listed. So it has come to stand for a, um, one of the documents of cold killing efficiencies bodies uh, tabulated in mathematical precision. But actually, when you look on the ground, place by place, by place what actually happens, we see something very different indeed. We see groups coming together, organized together, and often uh, killing in the same, same place. When one looks closer, we see that it's as often the SS units as it is especially in initial phase, as it is a Lithuanian national militia. And the same is, is sometimes true in the Ukraine. In essence, the, this first phase of genocide involved killing, this is the, the argument that I would put forward, in a 19th century sense, with guns, with local actors, and people being killed um, by essentially the killers going to the spaces in which they lived. The advent of death camps, the Nazi decision to kill all the Jews of Europe, and the initial organization of this killing at the Wannsee Conference in January 1942 changed this dynamic fundamentally, even if the two approaches overlapped logically. The change happened in two months in particular, in December 1941 and January 1942. And it meant that in the main, killers no longer went to the spaces of victims, but victims were sent to the site of killing. Now here, I'm not saying anything new at all. As you probably all know, Raul Hilberg worked out this spatial relationship already in the early 60s. 
I'm only suggesting that we bring it into a slightly different focus by underscoring that this meant the introduction to genocide of the central technologies that settler societies used to dominate vast spaces in the 19th century, namely the railroad with its timetable and logistics and the second central technology um, with respect to the death camps, that is to say the factory. Um, the factory in this case, not in the business of uh, production, but in the business of destruction, but essentially a 19th century um, mode of, of, of organization. This too, this, it's important to underscore the chronology. This is, was not an official fact of genocide. Um, as Nicholas Waxman has pointed out, concentration camps were actually marginal to the genocide until 1942, to give one statistic, especially with respect to the murder of the Jews in 1942, according to Waxman, Jews made up fewer than 5,000 of the 80,000 um, inmates of concentration camps in the Nazi empire. Meanwhile, at this very same time, in fact, even a bit earlier, by the end of 1941, some 600,000 Jews had been murdered across the newly Eastern territory. The argument that I would suggest is that at least in the first part of the genocide, the organization of it, the science of it, the, the administration of it has very deep roots in the 19th century. And it's not until this second phase of the genocide um, that one sees a qualitative shift in that aspect of its organization. And one important question I would say is what is, what, what is behind that qualitative shift? A very typical answer focusing on the killers has long been because the SS found it psychologically difficult. Another has been focusing on the actual killing mechanisms and that's the relationship of to the uh, euthanasia campaign, the T4, the people who manned the, the actual death camps like Sobibor and Treblinka. But you might also step back and think about this from the perspective of 19th and 20th century understandings of um, the domination of space and to see the initial genocide as much more rooted in an earlier 19th century part of it um, and not until January, uh, December, January, 1942, does that begin um, to change. I very much apologize for the discombobulation of my whole presentation here and, and all the problems, but that's the sort of short position paper that I wanted to put before you. Thank you. Thank you, Albert. I think you came across very clearly. I mean, we missed the graphs, but I think we got the idea very clearly.